Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to tonight's uh, Engaging Israel conversation. Um, as I think most of you know, uh, in Engaging Israel, what we really are trying to do at the Hartman Institute is kind of address the challenges that Israel faces in a somewhat more nuanced and values-based way than you are used to either having in your communities or seeing in the press. And our aim tonight is really just to have a kind of broad-ranging discussion of a number of challenges that Israel faces, but trying, as we have this discussion, to uh, uncover some of the value issues that lie behind the discussions. I don't think I need to introduce any of our panelists, Yossi, uh, Suzanne, and Gil. They're all distinguished thinkers and writers in their own right and, uh, and members of our Engaging Israel team. Unfortunately for them, they've agreed to let me give them a hard time. <laughs> and then I'm going to open it up to let you give them even a harder time. Uh, and I just wanted at the beginning to make something clear. This is not an evening about reaching agreement about anything. I happen to have the view that it shouldn't even be our aspiration to reach agreement about things. Um, what we're trying to do is kind of have a, a conversation about issues that divide us, but in a way that's respectful and in a way it looks at looks at the values that under, underlie those debates. And hopefully we'll leave tonight with a somewhat richer understanding of some of the challenges that face Israel. Um, and we'll be able to look at these, some of these issues with a, more of a Jewish sensibility. So I want to begin with a kind of much broad, a broad question that looks at the gaps that so many people feel there might be in developing between uh, Israel, Jewry in Israel, and Jewry particularly in North America. Some talk about uh, a values gap or a values divide between these two communities. And the three of you are people who spend plenty of time in both places. Uh, generali generalizations are a bit dangerous, but uh, I think you know, we can have a sense of where the pulse is, both in, both in Jewry here in Israel and in America. And I wanted to start by asking each of you, I'll start with you, Yossi, what is the one thing, what is one thing you think American Jews don't sufficiently appreciate or aren't sufficiently attentive to about where Jews in Israel are at the moment? Well, good evening. Can you hear? Well, we, we were told that we actually did not have to get close to the mic, but I guess that's, uh, that's not so. Um, is that better? old-fashioned mics. So, the, um, I'd say for me one of the most frustrating uh, gaps in, uh, in uh, the different perceptions uh, between American Jews and Israelis uh, concerns the, the nature of the political divide in Israel. Uh, I find that American Jews um, are often in a uh, kind of a time warp in understanding uh, the nature of uh, political discourse here, in particular about the Palestinians. Uh, the perception remains uh, uh, that uh, we are divided between two very powerful camps, the right and the left, uh, which is in fact an outmoded understanding of Israeli politics. A, a strong majority of Israelis, I would argue, are today centrists. And by centrists, I mean that, that uh, on the one hand, they accept the necessity of a two-state solution as an existential need for Israel. Uh, and on the other hand, they also accept the impossibility of reaching an agreement with the Palestinian leadership at this stage. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, is the, most Israelis are a combination of left and right. And you know, Tal, you had mentioned uh, that we, we all travel uh, in the States. And I, I often find when I, when I travel uh, and when I speak to Orthodox communities in the States that I'm in a kind of time warp where it feels as if it's still the 70s and the 80s. And uh, all we have to do is show enough resolve and continue to build settlements. And it's as if the first intifada never happened. And there's a kind of first intifada denial in the Orthodox community uh, in the United States. When I speak to liberal Jewish communities, uh, there's a second intifada denial very often. And it feels as if we are still in the 1990s and all we need to do is just find the right formula 
uh, the, the right language to negotiate an agreement with the Palestinians, and we're, we're just about there. And, uh, and most Israelis, uh, I would say, are, are living with a combination of the consequences of the first intifada, which, which showed us the untenability of the occupation, and the second intifada, which showed us the untenability of reaching peace with a national movement that doesn't recognize our legitimacy. Yossi, I'm going to come back to you on the peace stuff and perhaps I'm disagree sure with you a little. But uh, Gil, perhaps you can also speak to this issue of where, where do you see some kind of lack of appreciation? Result, Erev Tov, and welcome. It's great to see all of you, old friends. Ah. <laughs> Wasn't important, I was just welcoming you. <laughs> old friends and new friends. Uh, I don't know if you had an opportunity to read the newspaper, but just last week, the Jerusalem Raiders made it to the World Championships of Little League Baseball right here, and the final game was played out in Tel Gezer, uh, the Kibbutz Gezer, with a beautiful view of Tel Gezer, which is one of the oldest biblical cities that have been found by archaeologists. That same week, there was a full two-hour performance of a classic ballet in the Masorti High School the high school that's the flagship of the Masorti, the conservative movement here. My two daughters were in the ballet. My two sons were in the baseball finals. <laughs> and one of them, I'm proud to say, unlike his father, powered the Jerusalem Raiders into that final game by hitting two home runs, uh, pitching two scoreless innings, and catching the rest of the game. <laughs> what too many of my American Jewish friends and relatives miss is the poetry of the everyday, the normalcy here. We're so committed to the challenges of Israel. And even, Tal, I'll push back at you before you have a chance to push back at me, your introduction. We're not just engaging Israel in the challenges. We have to engage Israel on the ordinary, everyday life. The extraordinary effort sometimes it takes to live an ordinary life here. And the way it's also just casual and easy. Not every Israeli is Moshe Dayan. Not every Israeli is a hero. Not every Israeli is struggling daily just to get by. The challenge, what's the mood in Israel? Right, you come back, what's the mood? What's going on? Right, we have to get off that. We have to see the normalcy. And once we see that and embrace it, we can then change the conversation and not just focus on how can we help Israel, but how can having this extraordinary experiment help us, inspire us, speak to us, make us prouder Jews, deeper Jews, more thoughtful Jews, and create a real mutual partnership between American Jewry, or the diaspora broadly, and Israel? Thank you, Gil. Uh, Suzanne, let me flip it and ask you perhaps to speak to, what do you think one thing Israelis are not sufficiently appreciating about where American Jewry is today? Where, where Aren't we being heard? So I think, I think Israelis are really not appreciative enough of how immensely difficult it is to maintain a sense of Jewish identity in as open a society as America is. And I think this is, it is an incredible challenge. And usually what's focused on uh, is you know the neg the negatives that is the intermarriage rate or the declining amounts of participation the sort of barbell effect of either very religious or completely unaffiliated and I think that misses by focusing on that negative it misses what is an amazingly important experiment in America. <clears throat> of being Jewish in the most open civil society that there is and coming in to contribute and even lead it, but being fully Jewish. And there's been, and I think in, in thinking about that, think about the way the extremes in America of very unaffiliated Jews and very religious Jews identify with one another. The edges are softened, right? It's not the harsh clash. Right? That, and that's because there really is something of a sense among American Jews right, that they're going to somehow or another find a way right, to maintain this identity despite not sharing a common core at all, including an existential threat. 
And, and what place does Israel have in that kind of consciousness? Look, it would be, I, I, it, generally speaking, I think Israel is in good shape among American Jews, right? Despite all the uh, enormous furor, I don't think that there's been as quite as much of a decline as some of the figures seem to suggest. However, I think that it is important and also natural that American Jews understand themselves as their own distinct community. And that's a transition and a struggle. And understanding oneself as one own distinct community means that there's going to be right, something less than making the state of Israel right, a kind of um, the only thing that one shares as American Jews that everyone has to subscribe to. And that's OK. That's OK. <laughs> That, but I'm, this, is, this is coming from someone who's a passionate Israel advocate. This doesn't mean that we shouldn't be advocating, talking, debating. But we should also not allow it to become too divisive. Okay, thank you. Let's get to some of the issues and kind of um, look at some of the more controversial things that have happened in the country in the last period. And I wanted to start with the issue, which I don't know how much it played in America, but it was certainly a major issue here, and the issue of asylum seekers and immigrants. And let me just throw out some, some facts. Um, 14,955 is the number of asylum seekers and immigrants or infiltrators, depending on the term that people want to use, primarily from Eritrea and Sudan that came into Israel in this last year. And what we saw in this country, I think, particularly for many people, was disturbing, I think, for lots of Jews in Israel and also outside of Israel. A real sense of xenophobia, a real sense that um, these asylum seekers were unwelcome, potentially untrustworthy, uh, and that the key thing was to, um, to protect Israel's Jewish character by as quickly as possible removing them. There were, of course, other voices, but some of the more disturbing voices was to have uh, a member of Knesset from the coalition talk about the Sudanese as a cancer, later partially retracting it, to have um, an interior minister who speaks as if this is a war, where either we have to return the asylum seekers home or give up on the Zionist dream. <clears throat> and I think the, this kind of the way it played out in Israel was very, um, caused a lot of anguish for people who followed it, for people who were more concerned with Israel's obligations as a Jewish state to the principle of respecting the stranger and to our own history as refugees. And Doniel wrote a piece about this where he said that the fundamental tension here... Someone's playing a computer game, which sounds good. Um, Doniel wrote a piece where he said the fundamental clash here is, is between, on the one hand, the value of Jewish continuity. In other words, maintaining the character of Israel as a Jewish state and the continuity of Jewish values and having a state that respects those values. But I wonder whether, given the way Israeli society reacted in practice to this, the overwhelming voice, xenophobic voice, and particularly the way the asylum seekers themselves, once they've come into Israel, have been treated. And I want to put this to you, Gil, whether, whether we can blame many or some American Jews for saying, this is not my tribe, this is not how a Jewish state behaves. I'm, I'm appalled. I'm dismayed, calling human beings illegal aliens, building a wall to keep them out, allowing the police to stop people on the street who look like they might be aliens and potentially kicking them out of the country. Oh, are we talking about Arizona or Israel? <laughs> Let's put this in context. This is a problem facing many democracies, especially a democracy that many of you know quite intimately, the United States of America. How do you be an immigrant society, which the United States is, which Israel is, and be welcoming, and yet not too welcoming? Who belongs? And how do we maintain our identity? So that's the first context I want to put it in. I'll get to the difficulty. The second context, 
for the question is, I saw all the ugliness, and I'm not denying it, I'm not minimizing it, but I also saw tremendous pushback. When Eli Yishai, the interior minister, uses that disgusting word, infiltrator, and then he says he's trying to protect the Zionist dream, I heard on Galatz, on the, uh, the Israeli army radio, radio announcers saying, if he really cares about Zionism, why doesn't he have his kids and his grandkids serve in the army? And it was real good pushback. I know that while this whole thing was going on, in southern Tel Aviv, there's this magical, extraordinary high school, I'm sorry, elementary school, Bialik Rogovin, which brings in kids from 49 different countries and turns them into menches and turns them into humanists and turns them into Israelis. So I see the complexity in the same way that in the United States, I see the ugliness and the difficulty. <clears throat> so to get to the heart of your question, one, the response, this is not my tribe, these are not my people, is putting Israel on probation. He's saying, only, if only Israel is perfect, then it's acceptable. And, and that, I, I, I don't accept that. But we also did see in the ugliness a serious social problem, a serious educational problem. It's not only the challenge of trying to figure out how do you unpack this whole immigration dilemma. The deeper question is, and the deeper realization is, that we have to do some basic liberal values teaching in this society in order to achieve the kind of Jewish democracy that I want to achieve. You know, I think sometimes when, when Israel's criticized, we, we, our knee-jerk reaction is to do two moves. The first move is to say, who the hell are you to criticize? And the second move is, why are you criticizing me when you could be criticizing Syria, North Korea, Iran, name, name whoever you like? And both of those arguments have their place, but I don't think they have their place in a discussion about the kind of state we want to have as a people. Um, one, of the, I'm not sure, one of the statistics that I saw was that in the last years, Israel has given refugee status to 0.2% of the asylum seekers. Australia gives 42.3% 42, 42 of, of the requests. The US, 27.1%. And now obviously Israel's circumstances are fundamentally different, partly because it's a gateway for so many of these asylum seekers. And creating an incentive really does entail the risk of a massive influx that we couldn't sustain. But Suzanne, I wanted to ask you to try and have a guess or have a, have a stab at what a, Jewish, what a Jewishly inspired policy on this issue looks like. Okay, so let me first reiterate, because, um, you know, I teach Jewish law, which allows me to talk about Jewish and law, but it, it is, it's extremely important to first understand that what we're, we are talking about a question of Jewish values, because the question of political justice is quite clear. That is, um, immigration is something that all countries have absolute discretion over. All borders are policed. Right? And no one has equal rights to come into a country. Equal rights in countries happens after you're here, right? <laughs> right? but not to come in. So we're not talking about the question of political justice. We're talking about right? what do we as Jews believe our tradition helps us to see, whether or not we can fully realize it. And I think here we have two different um, ways that we could look at it. One, of course, is to look at it from the perspective of history, history and reciprocity. We have experienced this issue. We were refugees. We were asylum seekers. We know what it's like to have gates closed. But that is that, that aspect of history right, can only take us so far. There is also our own developed tradition, beginning with the Bible, of exactly how to treat right, the stranger. Right? We talk about this a lot. And I think it's worth noting that in the biblical tradition, and this is continued later on, there's a very um, interesting division between the stranger who's in your gate and the stranger who's outside your gate. right? You owe more to the stranger who is in your gate. Most of the exhortations in the Bible are about how you treat someone 
who is a stranger, who is not a full member of your community, who is living with you. And that, to me, was really something I think that we missed an opportunity about here. Because we could easily affirm a policy that says we cannot afford necessarily in Israel to take in an enormous amount of people. And at the same time, very firmly state that it is against our values to treat those who are already here in the reprehensible way that some did. There's um, one of the ways to describe that policy is, is I've heard is hard, in, hard outside, soft inside. In other words, that our borders are hard to get into, but once you're into, you find a, a treatment. Uh, I've been asked to not just moderate, but also express some opinions on this on this panel. I just sometimes I think about this issue by by thinking simply what I want a Jewish state to excel at. If you had to pick what the what the things we stand for are as a state, for me it is because of our history and our experience, this is one of those issues where we cannot afford a passing grade on. It's one of the issues where we need to be excellent at. I think education is another. I think we're going to get to this in a minute. I think the pursuit of peace is another. But I also think security is another because of what we've been through as a people. And when I say excellence, I mean we should be the country that is an example of how to treat asylum seekers. And that doesn't mean we have to accept everybody. But if you think of those things we want to be proudest of in this country that the Jewish people should represent, for me this is one of those issues and it's, one, it's, it's why it's been so painful to watch. Uh, you know, I can, af I can even live with us being less successful at baseball, uh, Gil, but this is an issue that's hard to take. I want to shift kind of rapidly uh, to the peace process. Uh, something I think that we talked about earlier today that, that an issue that is more vibrantly discussed almost in American Jewry than in Israel today. Uh, a little while ago I wrote a piece that, that where I described the fact that I thought that our attitude towards peace feels at the moment like it's boiled down to developing the talking points as to why it can't be achieved. And we have a pretty persuasive case as to why it can't be achieved. But that, the question is, is that good enough? You know, our tradition says, Bakesh shalom veradfehu, pursue peace and chase after it. That doesn't include an obligation to achieve it, funnily enough. And I think that's because achieving it is sometimes out of our reach and beyond our control. But the idea of Bakesh shalom veradfehu means that the pursuit of peace needs to be an inseparable part of who we are. And Yossi, I wanted to, to ask you not to explain why peace is not possible at the moment, but whether you think we might be able to do anything more in its pursuit. It's a very painful, it's a very painful question, I think, for, uh, for many of us, because um, I think that um, most Israelis feel themselves today to be, uh, if I could uh, coin a uh, Hebrew term, nifga uh, shalom. Uh, to be uh, casualties of the peace. And those coming out of this last decade, which was really a, a terrible decade for Israel in, in many ways, uh, a decade that began with four years of suicide bombings and then the uh, missile war with Hezbollah in, in 2006 and then 2009 with Hamas, uh, there's a feeling of uh, exhaustion uh, also a feeling of uh, having been betrayed, not necessarily by the Palestinians, but to some extent by ourselves, by our own uh, wishful thinking. Many of us who were enthusiasts of Oslo, I was at least at the beginning, uh, came to feel that we had been taken for fools. And, um, and in, in my understanding of, uh, of Jewish history and what Jewish history is saying to our generation, it's really saying two things to us. Uh, you're forbidden to be brutal and you're forbidden to be fools. And, uh, and I think sometimes that we've been both. And um, so in terms of, uh, so that's really, I would say, the psychological background, the baggage that many of us bring to, to that question. And uh, so we hear the word peace and, and it's, it's both a, um, it, it feels uh, 
both a, a, a rebuke to, uh, to our passivity, and, and we are admittedly passive today about peace, uh, and, uh, and also it feels vaguely threatening. Uh, the notion of resurrecting the peace process, which uh, the last time around led to the worst wave of terrorism in this country's history. And uh, Tal was speaking about his children, so I'll, I'll say briefly what it was like as a parent uh, raising two teenagers in those terrible years of 2000 to 2004 and uh, trying to keep them uh, for four years out of downtown. And, um, and I think that, that in some way we are still uh, recovering. That trauma is still so deep in the Israeli psyche that we are exhausted from, from the peace and the, the, after, the after effects of peace. So that, that's, that's one part of this. Uh, the other part of it is, um, is that you're absolutely right. shalom uh, we, we, we are mandated to pursue peace. Now, for me, when I, when I try to unpack that, that doesn't mean that I am mandated to pursue an illusory peace. And at this point, I think that trying to reach a diplomatic solution with, these, with this generation of Palestinian leaders, as it appears today, uh, is, is delusional for reasons that are not part of this discussion. But I think many of you, whether you agree or not with that position, can, can, can fill in what I mean. So in what ways, then, can we pursue peace? One thing that, that's really been on my mind lately is not the Palestinians. I think that in some sense, uh, the Palestinians are not going to be the first people uh, we're going to make peace with, but the last. It reminds me of the way we used to conceive of Lebanon. Uh, in the Israeli foreign ministry, the, the, the thinking in the 70s and the 80s was that Lebanon would be the first country, Arab country, we would make peace with in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, and in fact, Lebanon will probably be the last country because it's so weak and vulnerable. But uh, in terms of, of where we need to reach out, I would think, in, I, would, I would focus on two areas. The first are the Arab citizens of Israel. You talk about the strangers within your gates. Well, they're not really strangers. They're our citizens. They are, in fact, Israelis. And there we need to be doing a far better job of integrating them, not just, not just ending the, the disgrace of uh, inequality in government funding. That's a given. But we need to really begin a deep conversation with the Arab minority about who they are in relation to us and what is their place in Israeli identity. And when we speak about Israeliness, what exactly do we mean? Is it only Jewishness? What is the, what is the, the, the place that we can make? So that's, that's one piece of it. That's the part of the Arab or Muslim world that's closest to us. And the second outreach that I would really uh, urge us to think about is the vast Muslim periphery that is outside of the Arab world. The Arab world right now is going through changes that, that make it, I think, at this point, uh, in some sense, untouchable in terms of, uh, of, 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 a, of a peace outreach. But there is a vast mu Muslim periphery that we're ignoring. And if I could just say one last point about this. We've just come out of 2,000 years of a deeply traumatic relationship with Christianity. And that relationship is on its way, I think, in, in, in significant ways to healing. My, my deep fear is that we are facing a new pathological relationship with Islam, or large parts of Islam. And I frankly can't understand why both the Israeli government and the Jewish communities around the world haven't placed outreach to the Muslim world at the very top of our agenda. So in terms of making peace, I would reach out to Muslims First of all, in the United States, in North America. I would reach out to Muslims in India, in Indonesia. There is a, a, a vast hinterland that I think is, is, is at least possible to, to, to reach out to. And so it's, it's not quite perhaps what you were, what you were asking about, but uh, in terms of the Palestinians, I feel deeply, I feel frozen. That's the truth. 
Well, I think, you know, the pursuit of peace takes many forms. And I think, uh, you know, we first need to persuade ourselves that we're doing what's, uh, what's possible. Um, one of the most interesting statistics I've ever seen on this issue uh, was from a few years ago that 70% of Israelis supported the two-state solution at the time, but 80% said it didn't matter because it wouldn't happen anyway. <laughs> and, and, you know, there's a, saying, there's a saying, don't tell me what you believe. Show me what you do, and I'll tell you what you believe. And, Gil, have we given up on it? Or are we just being realistic? I agree with Yossi that Israelis are in post-traumatic stress. And uh, I can you know, go back to 2002, 2003, and I remember all we wished for was a little bit of quiet, a little bit of stability. And I used to say, because you know, everybody was looking, if we could find the right solution, if we could find the right formula, then ah, the gates will open and uh, the angels will start uh, blowing the shofar and we'll be, and it'll all be fine. And I said, I just want India cashmere. I just want like quiet. And in some ways we've had quiet. And maybe before, before we get to dramatic breakthroughs and dramatic changes, we just need a little bit of quiet. And we've had for the last couple of years a Palestinian prime minister, Fayyad, who's trying to do what we also kept on saying, which is stop destroying our state, but start building yours. So there's a little bit of room for optimism at the risk of being Mr. Happy Happy Talk tonight. But two things that I think we need to do which will help us move beyond the frozen state that we're in. One is not just outreach, but inreach. I'm disturbed that most Israeli school children are learning English and not Arabic. I'm disturbed at the general Israeli illusion that we're living in the United States as opposed to in the Middle East. Now, that's part of you know, the wonderful story of Startup Nation and all that, but also we have to start acknowledging the fact that we're in this neighborhood. And not just acknowledging it in terms of the trauma and the troubles and the, and the, and the bitter enemies we have, but also the, there was a, there's an early strain in Zionism of sort of delighting in the exotic Middle Easternness of this place. And if we don't learn Arabic language and Arabic culture, we can't do that and we don't teach that to our kids. That's one piece of it. The second piece of it, to get beyond that, that sense of, of, of stasis, is making sure that the Palestinians do what they need to do, which is building their own infrastructure. And... and you know, and acknowledging the fact that there are vast parts of the West Bank that the overwhelming majority of Israelis never enter. And treating them in more and more as an incipient Palestinian state, which in some ways is what the Netanyahu government has been doing, and start creating Israeli-style facts on the ground. But not just facts that are obstacles to peace, but facts that are, are, are pursuing peace. Let me ask you a question on that that bothers me just a little. You know, we, we make the case that we are essentially in favor of Fayyad's state-building efforts uh, because it's an Israeli interest to have a functioning Palestinian entity that's close to a state, even if it doesn't yet have all the capacities, is a pushback against Hamas. It creates the, the, the embryonic uh, elements of a two-state outcome. So sh why do we need reciprocity for it? In other words, if it's an Israeli interest that there be far-reaching um, improvements in the Palestinian state-building effort, why does it seem so hard sometimes for us to do that without asking for something in return, which is sometimes very difficult for them to give, even though perhaps they should give other things in return? First of all, it's not only in Israeli interests, but it's also in Palestinian interests to have state-building. Secondly, the opposite of reciprocity is unilateralism. We tried that with Gaza, and we failed. And now when we look back, one of the significant failures was that by not making it mutual, by not making it part of the negotiations, we gave the most violent extremists a victory they didn't deserve because they were able to have the narrative, ah, you see, you don't achieve it through negotiations. You don't achieve it through reciprocity, you achieve it through violence. So, But I'm talking about something else, Gil. I'm talking about a case where isn't there more that we could do in the West Bank in terms of allowing access to Area C, for instance, in terms of increasing the capacities in law and order, in terms of uh, all those kinds of civil infrastructure type things and rule of law and so on, where in return for doing those things, we didn't ask anything. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think, while I have criticisms of the Netanyahu government, when I've seen them lift some of the checkpoints, when I've seen them improve the security cooperation, I think that's a great thing. And you're right, we have to avoid the tit for tat, but on the other hand, we also have to think 
about, and I, and I think we have a failure. I, I sat with some Palestinian moderates uh, a few months ago in Abidus University, and they said, you don't know how much damage you do us because with the Shalit deal, and we're very happy that Gilad Shalit is, is home, with the Gilad Shalit deal, with the uh, disengagement from Gaza, you give the extremists a victory. You respond to them. What are you doing to us? Suzanne, let me, let me take this to, the, to the, one of the more kind of hard-edged sides of this, which is the, the settlement issue. You know, even if peace is out of reach for now, there is a very loud argument that you hear that the very fact that the the ve okay the, the, I mean a very common argument a loud argument is that the very fact that we are involved in the settlement enterprise is simply making this more difficult. And there are many ways in which that argument is made, but from a Jewish values perspective, it's made in several ways. First, that recognizing Palestinian rights to self-determination should be a Jewish value. Second, that by building the settlements, we endanger Israel's aspiration to be a Jewish and democratic state. And some even argue that we are morally we're doing wrong morally by the settlers themselves. By, for instance, we just had the, for those of you who follow this closely, the Ulpana arrangement, where eight houses were removed, but in return for a commitment to build 300. And I wanted to ask you, let's assume, let's assume that you accept this argument that settlements go against the continued building of settlements go against not just Jewish interests, but at the moment at least, some Jewish values. What's so problem, problematic about calling for a boycott of settlement products because of that? Uh, I think calling for a boycott of settlement products uh, is a deeply problematic thing. Are you not hearing me? Look, um, if I were to get, I, I have to answer this, I think, um, on two different levels, one of which is a kind of intellectual level in which I get very abstract and I really talk about Jewish values and Jewish history, uh, in which case we might have to have a very fine-grained conversation about um, majorities versus minorities, rights of protest, how, right, how much value there is in kind of group minority expression. Right? Uh, but I have to tell you that before I go into that, I have to state my gut. Right? <laughs> I, it's just very important for me to do that because my gut is that calling for the boycott of settlements is the kind of deeply divisive, one-note way of looking at things that is disturbing at the core to me. Uh, I think that people, Jews, who want to have a serious conversation about values here, have to have that conversation about values first, face-to-face, -face, before they leap in and take unilateral action. Now, having said that, right? Having said that, because I find I, I find the call for a boycott extremely disturbing at the emotional level. Having said that, if I were honest about the tradition, right, and trying to understand the tradition, right, um, boycotts per se, right, the idea. Right? that people would try to accomplish something, right? try to accomplish something through organized social action. This is an historic form of expression. We can think about it in terms of the chayrim, right? or social, right? or somehow right? putting a ban on certain um, people or groups because they have not behaved right, in a way that is conducive to moral conduct. At the under end of the spectrum, however, 
right? It is a very important traditional value not to interfere with people's livelihood and not in any way to cause them to lose somehow, right, their ability to make a living. So if we think about it in these traditional terms, somewhere along between these two kinds of values, right, there's a certain amount of discretion as to when one can boycott or not. It's actually, in my view, not actually the right way to think about the whole issue. I think the right way to think about the whole issue has to do with democratic processes, right? I mean, the question of, and it's very delicate because the whole question of boycott historically, and it's true in America as well, right, really has to do with where do you think the mob is, right? Those, in some way, boycotters make a kind of claim, right, that majority rule, right, somehow um, doesn't need to be respected because it's mob-like and not affirming values. And the majority basically makes the claim, right, that the minority is really interfering with democratic processes when it's a cohesive minority intent on getting its way. For me, I think, and, and, and this has been an age-old battle in the, in the Jewish sources, from the medieval period on, they have struggled with the question, for example, when there's a community enactment. A community enactment, right, is a kind of really good early analogy, right, to government, to Jewish government. And the question was always, right, once you accepted the legitimacy of a community and its government, right, shouldn't the majority rule, right? Or do you allow a minority to undermine and go against that majority? The rabbinic tradition never has a yes or no answer. Right? It never has a yes or no answer. It kind of phrases and con we know that, right? It puts these ideas out there and it tries to let you think about them a little bit more in a more complicated way, right? But in general, in this situation, and I think this is also the tenor of where the discussion is, it is you've got to decide which group do you really think is undermining democratic processes. That's the issue. Um, thanks, Suzanne. For me, this also touches on the question of how we argue as a people, even with those for whom we feel so fundamentally opposed to. Um, and whether the boycott in the end is a legitimate tool in the intra-Jewish conversation. I can understand a boycott from a, a non-Jewish, like from, from outside of the Jewish world, even if I don't agree with it, I certainly don't agree with its effectiveness. But, but at some level I have a much harder time with the, the message we're saying when we boycott one another about one another's legitimacy. But Yossi, I wanted to put something a little harder to you. Harder than this. Harder than this. <laughs> Just a very simple question, which I'm going to push you to answer directly. Maybe you'll, 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 I'm sure you'll, it'll be a slam dunk. In the present circumstances, is the settlement enterprise morally justifiable and how? Mm. I can't answer the other question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I've actually uh, just, can, can you hear me? I've, uh, I've actually just completed a book about, uh, which touches on uh, the origins of the settlement movement. It's one of the facets of, of, this, of this project. And it's extraordinary to go back to the summer of 1967 and to see, first of all, that all the warnings were laid out from the beginning. Amos Oz had a classic piece in the labor newspaper, Davar, uh, warning that there is no such thing as a benign occupation and that in the end an occupation would boomerang on us. Uh, at the same time, one finds the, the warnings on the right about what would happen if we empowered terrorists in the hills overlooking Tel Aviv. It's all laid out there. And then we spent the next 40 years 
shouting past each other and repeating those arguments that were all laid out in the summer of 67. Now, in addition to that, it's, it's quite moving to go back and see what the origins of the settlement movement were. The first settlement uh, was uh, in, in the West Bank, was uh, Kfar Etzion. Kfar Etzion uh, was uh, founded in September 1967 by the children who had been born there. Kfar Etzion was destroyed in 1948. So the first settlement was an expression of the return of a group of children who had been exiled from there and were returning to their home so that the initial impetus of the settlement movement had nothing biblical or abstract about it. It was a tangible return to the literal homes that these people had lived in. Now one can argue whether uh, that opened the floodgates and, and, and if we're allowing the return of the children of Kfar Zion, what about the refugees? Palestinian refugees to the state of Israel. The, there are infinite moral variations to this, to this, to this story. But I, I mention this because there, there, when you think about the settlement movement 40 years later, there's something deeply distorting in whatever one's position is. And when you go back to the origins, you realize that, that there was something so um, pure actually, that's, that's I, I, I'm, I'm hesitating to use that word, something pure and noble in those early years, which I think uh, got lost for many reasons. Some of those reasons were inevitable and some of those reasons were, were predicted by, by the left. But if, if but Tal, what I hear you, you uh, what I hear you asking is, um, is whether we have the right to build today. I personally would favor a, uh, another settlement freeze, and I say another settlement freeze to remind us all that this right-wing government did in fact impose a 10-month freeze, and we're not getting political, but I wanted to remind us of that. And my sense is that settlements today are problematic for two reasons, and neither of those reasons concerns uh, peace because uh, I think that settlements are not uh, the, certainly not the primary obstacle to peace, and I don't think that they are in the end a substantive obstacle to peace. And by the way, regarding the boycott, I would say that one of the deepest objections that I have to the proponents of the boycott is that they are reinforcing the misperception in the international community that the main obstacle to peace are settlements. I think that is a tragic um, mis, mis, mis handling of, uh, and I'm, tr I'm trying to restrain myself. <laughs> so um, in, I think that settlements today are problematic for two other reasons. One is that they send a message uh, to the Palestinians of uh, psychological helplessness. They reinforce Palestinian sense uh, of not being in the most basic control of their, of their environment. That's, that's the first reason. And if we're looking to, to at least, um, if, if not actively pursue a political peace at this point, at least not sabotage the possibility long term, then settlements certainly psychologically are a major impediment toward reconciliation between Israel and the Palestinians. The second problem, from our point of view, is that we play into the hands, again, of those who would like to cite Israeli actions as the major impediment for peace, while ignoring what I think uh, is the reason for the absence of peace, and that's the Palestinian insistence on refugee return. So I think settlements uh, play into the hands of those who would who don't, do not wish Israel well. Okay, um, in a little while, not too much longer, I'm gonna give you a chance, and I hope some of you are writing down questions on any of those issues. We're gonna to touch on a couple more before we open it up. And I'm gonna jump now to the issue of Iran. Gil, one of the things that many people think is in the subtext of the debate about Iran is I would say the following thing. The US is essentially saying to Israel, we may need more time to allow sanctions and diplomacy to work. 
And Israel is saying, if we give you that time, you're effectively asking us to abdicate our capacity to act militarily. That is somewhere below the surface in a lot of the way this debate is read. And I wanted to ask you, first, what does America have a right to expect of Israel in relation to the Iranian issue? What does Israel have a right to expect of America from a moral perspective? And to take it to a second level, let's assume Israel were to engage in military action. How do we think through the moral dilemma that our action could end up risking and costing American lives? It's really more fun to talk about the Jerusalem Raiders and their baseball game, but uh, as you were asking the question, I was thinking back to the difficult dilemmas of the first Persian Gulf War. When George H.W. Bush was putting together this coalition and it was understood that in order to get Iraq out of Kuwait and have this coalition which included Saudi Arabia, which included Egypt, which included Arab countries, Israel couldn't be a part of the coalition. And not only that, once the scuds started falling, that Israel had to restrain itself. And a right-wing government led by Yitzhak Shamir followed the American orders. There's a difficult dance between the United States and Israel. And we, when we look at our New York Times and we see a map of Israel and we see a map of the United States, they look like they're the same size. And it's a mistake. It's a mistake to forget that the United States is a superpower, 300 plus million strong, dealing on a very different level in the world stage than Israel. On the other hand, it's a mistake to forget just how far the United States is, and many of you, I, I, I'm telepathic, many of you I think have gone that long journey recently. It's far away. That distance creates safety. And Israel is very, very close, uncomfortably close to Iran. And both Israel and the United States, rhetorically, according to the mullahs, and according to Ahmadinejad, are in the sites, but Israel is a little bit too much closer and a little too, and too vulnerable. And so within that dance has to come intelligent policy. And there are so many obstacles to intelligent policy. The hysteria in the media, the shadow boxing that occurs with the leaks that go on from the different governments, and then the shadow boxing that occurs with this retired official speaking out and that retired official speaking out. And then you don't know to what extent is this because they're critical of the Netanyahu government or they hate Obama? Or is it because the Netanyahu government or the Obama government wants them speaking in order to create a little disinformation vis-a-vis -vis Iran? So within all that fog, it's very difficult to find good policy. But fundamentally, I go back to the, 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 the simplistic view of foreign policy that nations don't have friends, they have interests. And even when we talk about the core values that unite the United States and Israel, and we talk about the fact that it's a truly a natural alliance. It's not just choreographed and pushed around by APEC, but it's a natural alliance that grows for so many reasons. Ultimately, Israel has to sit down and say, what's our bottom line? What's our red line? And the United States has to say, what's our bottom line? What's our red line? And try to be working together as much as possible, but to understand that at a certain point, there might be disagreements and, and, and deviations. And ultimately, Israel has to defend itself and can't just rely on Big Mama to take care of it. Suzanne, I'm going to ask you to be more pointed than Gil, though Gil made an, an important analysis. Let's assume we go, I'm repeating the question, assume we go for military action. And we, our assessment suggests that that means American troops in Iraq and Afghanistan or possibly elsewhere are endangered, possibly American embassies are endangered, possibly terrorist attacks. What is our moral responsibility to the United States? Uh, I think this is a question of, uh, frankly, turned around that first moral duty, moral duty of a state is to protect its citizens. <laughs> that has to be the first moral duty. If I could, the, 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 the trick is here that the, the moral duty is for the state to do what it thinks is best to protect its citizens, even when everybody else might think that that's ridiculous. Is yes, that what you're saying? I am. Yeah. 
Actually, yes, I am. Because I, although, look, I want to be very, I, I think there's something interesting here. And from a values perspective, let me say this that's interesting. One of the most, um, to my mind, one of the most productive ways in the days when we had a far more civilized form of rabbinical discourse about Israel uh, than we are having in the last decade. But when the you know, early chief rabbis right, were thinking through how to do this new venture called Israel and try to incorporate Jewish religious values in it and think about it in those terms. I think one of the most important insights that several of these Zionist religious thinkers thought about was that Israel is in some way a partnership. And it is a partnership because it was given birth to by the will of Jews and the will of non-Jews through the United Nations. And in thinking through how to apply halacha, right, from their, you know, from the rabbinic perspective, to think about, right, to think about the state of Israel, looking at it from this new category, right, of a partnership, right, which is partly a reality, right, that Israel is in the community of nations, and one of the community of nations became a very, very important part of the puzzle. And this is the situation, really, that you're talking about with Iran, which is, it is clear to me that the state's first duty, right, is to its own citizens. That is a moral duty. But at the same time, Israel is within the world. So when you say that the rest of the world thinks Israel is foolhardy in doing this, right, and including our friends, right, that this is the wrong decision to make, that isn't, right, that, that ratchets it up. And I think that a responsible state listens in seriousness, takes it into account, but, not does, but then makes its own decision and must make its own decision. Yes, so you wanted to wait. Yeah, I think the missing word here is existential. Uh, that when a, when a state, mm -hmm. the, uh, the missing word here is existential. Uh, yes, we have moral responsibilities to the United States. And, uh, and I think the example that Gil cited before is, is, is useful. Uh, when the Israeli government uh, understood that, that the Scuds, Saddam Hussein's Scuds, were not in fact an existential threat, and that in showing restraint, even though it would have negative consequences in terms of Israeli deterrence, those consequences were not ever existential. And therefore, we could show our appreciation for the United States, we could act as a responsible ally, help protect American soldiers in Iraq by not thrusting ourselves into the conflict, uh, then I think we, we exercised proper restraint. In a case where we perceive, deeply perceive, whether, whether one agrees with, with our conclusion or not, the perception here is that a nuclear Iran is an existential threat. Under those circumstances, I think that it's the United States that has the moral responsibility not to ask us to, uh, to restrain ourselves uh, in, uh, in, in an issue of life and death. Thank you. Touch on one more issue, uh, and then we'll talk about one bigger thing that I wanted to tease you about. Uh, something in the news today, and very much in the news in the last weeks, is the issue of the draft for ultra-Orthodox uh, into the army. And I wanted to, without succeeding, I think, in doing it justice, I wanted to make something of the ultra-Orthodox case, as it's been explained to me. The, the ultra-Orthodox, in their mind and in their conviction, regardless of the halachic debate on this issue, have been engaged in the protection of the Jewish people long before the State of Israel came around and IDF came around. They were the ones that passed the torch of Torah from generation to generation, and they are the ones who they believe today, with absolute conviction, are protecting the Jewish people and the essence of the Jewish people by the commitment to the study of Torah. Isn't the one place on earth where that, respect, where that conviction should be respected a Jewish state? Suzanne. Suzanne. 
Mm. Uh, yes, up to a point. Um, I think, in fact, that perhaps not articulated, that this is precisely why we don't have a resolution yet. I mean, I do think that, in fact, most Israelis, despite all the conversation about being angry about it and feeling that it's terribly unjust uh, that the Haredi get a free pass while another segment of the population has to carry all the burden, right? In some way deeply feel that this is their past, the past that brought them to here, to the present, and are highly innerly torn about this. Right? Many secular, in a torn. At the same time, the numbers have become so large right, that we are in danger, in my view, of creating um, either one of two things. That we're in danger of creating a situation in which the burden is simply intolerable without dividing into what are basically two societies that completely have nothing to do with one another. So that is, in fact, what some urge. What some urge is, in fact, to create an exemption. But creating this total exemption goes along, often, if you read it carefully, with a kind of fantasy of actually segregating Haredi. Right? And they'll live in, right, there will be no interchange at all. They will be not only self-segregated, but actually segregated. That, on the one hand, right, as opposed to, right, a second idea, which I also find difficult, that we have to be careful about, which is a kind of fantasy of wholesale integration for their benefit, right? That there's going to be social and economic incentives given and social and economic integration given, and what is left a little bit less said is, they're going to be like us by the time it's over, right? There'll be cultural in, right, assimilation. And I don't think that's, uh, I actually think that's not likely, but it's also not a worthy goal. Let me stop you here for, do you want it to continue? No, it's okay. okay. Yossi, one of the paradoxes here, I think, is that the Haredi community at one level may be per perfectly satisfied with being segregated, as Suzanne said, and the Israeli army at one level has no idea what to do with all these orthodox potential recruits. So why can't we just let it be? I'll uh, go back to, uh, before answering you, go back to what you were saying earlier and further sing the Haredi community's praises in that uh, this is a community that has undertaken voluntary poverty. And it is... Uh, it's an extraordinary example. I don't know of any community like this anywhere else. There are monastic communities, but those are self-selecting elites. Here we're talking about mass, mass numbers, growing numbers, as Suzanne pointedly noted, uh, of, uh, of, of people who have undertaken really an unprecedented effort and seen in, in, in the light of a, as a post-Holocaust phenomenon, I think it's, it's, it's actually deeply moving. Uh, at the same time, I think it has no spiritual legitimacy. No legitimacy to, to sustain an entire community in a state of voluntary poverty. This is not, their, this is not a Jewish value. And I would go further, having sung their praises, to say that um, the continuation of the status quo, as you're asking, uh, is an existential threat, to use the E word again. It is a long-term existential threat to Israel. The Haredi community is growing exponentially. And to, to maintain a community in this condition of radical separatism, uh, first of all, deeply undermines the morale of those of our, of our sons who serve. 
and you're hearing this more and more. The, the protest movement that's now, that set up a, um, an encampment at, uh, at Netanyahu's office has chosen the resonant uh, slogan, Machane Freier, Machane Freiering, mm. the camp of suckers. Now, that, there, there is nothing more that Israelis fear than being suckers. And this could have long-term consequences in terms of undermining the morale of a country under siege. So for that reason and for many others, we cannot sustain this. I'll say one thing about this. I think there's a fundamental difference between having a Jewish and democratic shtetl and a Jewish and democratic state. A Jewish and democratic state, for one thing, gets to be as Jewish as democracy allows, not the other way around. And the idea of burden sharing is something that the state needs to decide how to create that calibration appropriately, not the individual sectors within the state based on their individual con uh, convictions. Now, one of the values of this state, I think, has to be, for historical and values reasons, the respect of those committed to Torah learning in the way that they are. But that must be balanced against a sense of equal burden sharing throughout, throughout the country. You know, we, you can have breakaway minyanim, right? Breakaway uh, congregations whenever you're not happy with how the chazan davens or the rabbi's sermon. But you can't have breakaway states. And that requires a commitment to the whole as well. I want to get to the last issue. Uh, Gil, um, you know, hopefully your heads are hurting a bit. This has been deliberate to jump and to show you how we can have a debate about so many issues here and so many values clashing with one another. There's this great scene I love in Everybody Loves Raymond, where uh, the, Raymond takes his son to, he goes to see his son in a basketball game, and his son has a shot, unlike your son, his son has a shot at the, the, you know, the basket and misses. And Raymond goes, oof, like this. So it's unlike my son. Unlike your son, I said. <laughs> unlike, unlike, <laughs> unlike. If Halavai, like your father, son was there. Like son. <laughs> so Raymond goes, oof, when his uh, son misses the basket. And the coach comes up to, to Raymond to admonish him and he says, at this school we try to teach the children that the space outside the basket is as valid as the space inside the basket. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and sometimes, sometimes I feel like when we're having these conversations, there's this uh, mushiness that uh, I find hard to take, that every, everything's valid and everything's okay. And I wanted to you to give me some hard edges if you think. Is there something in the conversation about Israel, in the Jewish conversation about Israel that is beyond the pale, that is illegitimate, that we should say that is not as valid a position as that? Absolutely. I think we have to do a much better job of drawing red lines and what I call blue and white lines. Blue and white lines is we have to affirm that which we agree. The idea of the legitimacy of a Jewish state which shouldn't be debated the notion that Israel's rights shouldn't be put on probation, the, the notion of Jewish nationalism, Jewish sovereignty, and red lines. The two biggest red lines for me are the A word and the R word. To talk about Israel, and I'm purposely pausing, and compare it to the South African apartheid regime, the ugly, racist apartheid regime, and, and, and even simply saying, no, it's not that, makes us link the I word and the A word, and that's why I'm getting awkward because I want a lot, of light, a lot of space between those two ideas, is to me completely reprehensible. Should we, bo should we boycott someone who makes that argument? I think, we, uh, I think a little bit of shunning isn't a bad thing. I have no problem, uh, first of all, criticizing and so, making it. So settlement pro products, no, but people who make I didn't. I didn't touch that one, but. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I'll, you know, I'll, 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 I'll share something from my own personal biography. Um, Peter Beinart, has, in his book, The Crisis of Zionism, uh, used the A word and the R word. He talked about apartheid. He played on the fact that he's the grandson of South African uh, immigrants and, and used that to sort of add to his moral standing. And he also called Israel racist vis-a-vis -vis its, uh, its, its, in, in its relations to its Arab citizens. Race doesn't come into this. It's a national conflict. And to inject the racism term, 
is, and having just finished a book on the 1975 Zionism's Racism Resolution, I have a lot to say about this, is part of a Soviet move from the 1970s that the Arabs embraced to delegitimize Israel, to demonize Israel. But Gil, it's a national conflict. Gil, can't you, just, so, can't you just have an argument with the person who is so wrong rather than ah, delegitimizing? So, wait a minute. So, so I criticized Beinart, but I've also written on his blog, Open Zion. And I've, now I've become a regular columnist on Open Zion. And someone said, how can you do that? You're legitimizing him. And I said, I don't get into boycotts of people. So I'm not boycotting him, but I'm in the strongest way possible saying what you have said crosses a line. Now, I'm just me. So I'm not, I, I'm not important enough to stop him from attending a synagogue, from being invited to the president's conference, which he was, uh, to war going around the, the Jewish world and getting all kinds of speaking gigs and, and, and high speaking fees. That's fine. He's doing it. But for me to say that this is, this is beyond the pale is not a problem. And I, and I think it's important. I think we have to have more clear lines where we say, to use those words, you have to understand the, 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 the history, the legacy behind those, and it's simply unacceptable. Suzanne, why can't this just rise and fall on the merits of the argument? Is there, you know, is there a position that, what do we mean when we say beyond the pale? What we mean, I think, I hear, beyond Gill's example, is that there are opinions that people hold in the Jewish world which should be ex uh, exercised, essentially, should be, we should boycott. Where is the distinction? Well, I don't agree with Gill about this. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, um, I come from a world of academic freedom, perhaps I, overvalue the world of academic freedom, but I doubt it. Uh, I think that uh, silencing voices right, is precisely what goes on in the community with regard to people who are advocates of Israel, right? that their voices are being silenced in a systematic way on campus. It's a very, very bad thing. But if one believes strongly right, that one can speak and should speak out on behalf of Israel, one can't silence others. And we shouldn't. And I think it is much, much more important to engage them. Somebody like Peter is somebody who I believe right, is, has extremely good intent. <laughs> and I don't agree with him. I don't agree with him at all. I don't agree with him tactically. I think the position is uh, both extreme and kind of um, so purist as not to be something that um, makes sense in the context of a lived state. Uh, and I surely don't agree with the call to boycott the settlements. At the same time, he is a part of the Jewish conversation and has to be engaged and should be engaged. Yossi, very briefly, if you wanted to weigh in. There are two recent examples of um, Jewish uh, individuals or organizations being kept out of Jewish communal space. One is uh, Pamela Geller. I think this was in LA, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Pamela Geller, who is advocating a Jewish holy war against Islam. Uh, she was kept out of, I think, the LA Federation building. And uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, uh, which is being kept out of Hillel's uh, across the country. Now, those, I, I think that if we go back to, to setting red lines, I think those are two very useful examples of far left and far right that should be beyond the pale of the values that the Jewish, the normative Jewish community wants to convey. We are under no responsibility to support an organization that denies the right of Israel to exist. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, we are under no, uh, we, we, we have no commitment to give a stage to someone who would like to ignite a holy war between the Jews and one billion Muslims. I think we need to be, I think we need to be sensible about who we are, what our basic interests are. Uh, you call it a boycott, one can call it red lines, and, uh, and as far as Peter Beinart concerns, is concerned, no comment. <laughs> Um, I don't know, it's, it's, it strikes me on this issue that, you know, I, I, I side with Suzanne here a lot more in the sense that the best thing you can do for an argument is to try to silence it. 
um, I think a lot of these arguments are defeated simply on their weakness. Um, and I, you know, I, I disagree fundamentally with the idea that a Jewish state shouldn't exist. But I don't disagree with the right of someone to make the case that Judaism could be better off without sovereignty, as Martin Buber made, made the case. I think they're wrong. I think they're unrealistic. But perhaps they're unwise. But are they beyond the pale? It's hard for me to see that. Um, I wanted to open up a little bit for questions from you before we get some final thoughts. Uh, we have a few minutes, we have a little bit of time. So if anyone wants to ask a hard question, if your heads aren't hurting too much, uh, feel free. Yes? Okay, let me try to put that into the concluding comments. Okay. Yes, at the back, very far at the back. Gorenberg, like, don't you feel as a Jewish journalist that you're often conflicted and, and sort of confused about how to cover, say, the settlement issue or whatever is going on in Israel? He said, well, it's just like being a French journalist. I, you know, I don't, and I was actually really shocked with his response. <laughs> um, and I guess the reason why I'm asking this, I, I, I don't agree with it. Um, I think that there is so much in Jewish history that makes being a Jewish journalist I think just more difficult than being a French journalist or anybody else um, in a certain respect. But on the other hand, I can see how maybe Latino journalists in America have faced similar issues covering you know, the immigration debate. So I guess this leads me to sort of what you're talking about with Peter Beinart. I mean, I think he probably um, suffers from the same confusion or how do you sort of maintain you know, objectivity, especially when you're writing for a, a secular audience, and at the same time, not bring up topics which you think sometimes are, like, I think the BDS movement to a certain extent is ludicrous, and I don't agree with it personally, but as a journalist, um, do I cover that? Do I actively say to my editor, listen, um, there's a group of American University presidents coming next week. I think it's a really good story in light of the fact that the BDS movement, um, part of it is boycotting Israeli universities. You know, that's one story that's happening next week. As a journalist, do I actively seek to try to cover that if I personally just am totally, okay, I think I it's important. Okay, I got the question. Uh, Yossi, I think this touches on a kind of somewhat broader issue. Uh, that how much does our Jewishness affect what we say in the public arena where voices other than the internal Jewish voice hears it, which is more, more or less most of the time. You know, it's, it strikes me, you know, I wanted to, to put a, a very difficult hypothetical to you, um, but we ran out of time, uh, where essentially Obama gets re-elected for a new term, Netanyahu is persuaded that he should go for a, another peace initiative. It completely explodes in his face, terrorism everywhere, and it leads to the election of a very, very hard right Israeli politician who wants to annex settlements, demand loyalty from Arab citizens, all these difficult things. And then and there are Jews outraged throughout the world that Israel is engaged in this policy. Not unlike the settlement issue, but I'm making it more, more harsh deliberately. Where do your Jewish responsibilities lie to protecting the inner kind of the the inner conversation, or if you're a journalist, just telling it as it is? Well, the the ethical question that you're really asking is, what is your responsibilities professionally as a journalist, and what is your responsibility as a Jew? When you take on a certain role in journalism, you are bound by the ethics of journalism, first of all. No one, no one has told you to go into that position. You are now taking that on. And that means if you take on the role of being a reporter, you need to report what you see honestly, whether or not it reflects well at the moment on Israel. Uh, now that, the rules change in different forms of journalism. 
there's op-ed writing, and Peter Beinart is not in your category because he is blatantly an opinion writer and he chooses uh, what to highlight and he chooses to highlight on Israel's blemishes in a way that I find, again, to speak in a restrained way, unhelpful. <laughs> and, um, and then there are, there's feature writing, there, there, there's, any, there are any, there's any number of aspects. Now, you asked a question about uh, what should you do in terms of suggesting stories. If, that's your, if you're taking the initiative, first of all, if you get a, if you get a story assignment, you have to fulfill that assignment as an ethical journalist. And, and in that sense, Gershom is right as if you were a French journalist. If you are initiating a story, I think that's more of a gray area. And then you certainly have the right to say, well, is this really the story that I want people to read about Israel? Uh, maybe uh, there's another story that I can tell about Israel. That's your initiative. Let's take another question. Yes. Um, in Gaza, um, one of the ways of describing it would be that a uh, group of some 8,000 or so Jews were uh, expelled from their homes, <coughs> excuse me, because they were Jews, uh, making a Jewish free area, proving to the world that uh, population transfers are all right. And um, so I'm, uh, I'm uh, wondering how those people are doing. Uh, immediately following that, my understanding was that there was a lot of disarray about their about any efforts to um, rehabilitate them. So, uh, and I haven't heard any any follow up. So I'm asking about that. Gil, do you want to speak to the, the disengagement and its fallout and benefits? This is actually a very painful topic. Uh, there are m many of them who have become fully integrated back into Israeli society. I, I can't speak numbers, uh, but there are those who, who were broken by the experience and remain broken. And it's funny, we were just talking about this today around the table before our formal Engaging Israel meeting. I felt very strongly at the time and continue to feel that the left made a huge tactical and moral error, error when, the, when the disengagement occurred. The left should have made sure that these people were embraced. The left should have made sure that these people were nurtured. Now, the state did come in and offer all kinds of packages, but this was an opportunity, if you truly want to have disengagement from the West Bank, if you truly want to have a two-state solution, if you truly want to have a situation where vast numbers, way larger than the 8,000, are removed from the West Bank or invited to leave or paid off, it was incumbent upon those people who were most committed to territorial withdrawal to make sure that it was as smooth a transfer as possible, as smooth a transition as possible. And I remember at the time speaking to some of my friends from the far left, and I said, you're not doing anything. And they said, well, they've gotten so many goodies over the years, and they've already hijacked the state, and they're getting so many payouts, and it didn't understand, and it didn't show any empathy, and it didn't show any Jewish love for these people. And it was a failure. And on the other hand, there were you know, tr tremendous moments of heroism there from both sides where Israeli soldiers went in and with real love and respect helped people who didn't want to leave, leave their homes. And people in those homes whose first instinct would have been to stay and fight chose not to. So there are a lot of positives in the story, but in that moment, there was a real failure on those who, who needed to show, we're going to make this as easy as possible. We're going to make this a model transition to a new state. OK, yes. Notwithstanding the fact that the American elections are not one issue, does he, do you think the panel think that it makes any difference as to who is elected in the next American presidential election? Um, Suzanne, you want to speak to that in any way? <laughs> you heard the whispers behind here. Don't go there. <laughs> um, first of all, did you all hear the news about Obamacare? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think you Oh, the, um, the uh, health care was in most respects upheld as constitutional. Yes. Right? Hmm? Five to four, but Roberts voted with the majority to uphold 
uh, including the mandatory provision, which was upheld on the basis of power to tax. Uh, there was a limitation placed on penalizing states for uh, not ex right, ex take, too much detail. Doing, well, whatever. <laughs> this is my way of filibustering this okay. question. Let me, if you'd like, if <laughs> you'd like I'll respond. I'd love to I'll answer take, another take. one about women. We're going to get mean, there. A question about women. I Suzanne, mean, we're going to get there. That. I'll just say one. <laughs> Uh, this will be an easy one. In my, my, my experience in policy, I'm a diplomat by training, is that we, we attribute far too much relevance to the occupant yeah. of the White House in relation to the uh, d developments in the Middle East. I think there are some people who believe that if only there was this US policy, then this would be the outcome in the US. Uh, it's, it's far more complex than that. Uh, I'll, we'll leave it at that and we'll take another question that touches more on the values side of things, if possible. Yes. Yes. I find it a, a bit amu amusing that someone who's so worried about the Sudanese would even bring up the issue of boycotting uh, Judea Samaria. Also, it's interesting to have two fellas up there who were in Kipot who can't say the words. Judea Samaria. But be that as it may, right now, if you take a look from the river to the sea, there's a 67% Jewish majority. It is looked at that within the next 10 years, there will be an 80% Jewish majority. There are close to 400,000 Jews living in our biblical homeland. No one has talked about what's obvious, which is a two-state solution is total nonsense at this point. And the issue that we're going to have to face is a one-state solution. What do you guys feel about that? Um, okay, well, I think first I should say that, that the idea in this conversation was pretty much to address every issue and look at it in different ways, uh, to address the issue of settlement boycott, whether one approves of it or not. Uh, does anyone want to address that question? Um, Yossi. Uh, Judea and Samaria is a uh, part Good. of this land. We like that. Is a part of this land that I personally deeply love, feel deeply attached to, and if and when we'll have to leave most of it, it will be a tragedy, but a necessary tragedy. Uh, the way that I conceive, the way I try to imagine what a withdrawal would be like is something like um, the transition from. Uh, Israeli Memorial Day to Israeli Independence Day. Uh, I, could, I would conceive of a day of mourning for giving up uh, Hebron, for giving up parts of the land that are as deep as deeply a part of those of us who favor a two-state solution as those who oppose it. So in, this, in that sense, no one loves this land more than anyone else, and I think that that's not the issue. The issue is a question of competing values, which is what Tal was speaking about earlier. And there are other values at play, and what, what I find so painful about the Jewish debate from the left and the right is that, for me, the left and the right are mirror images of each other. And the reason that left and right are mirror images is because each each side knows the Jewish value that it is upholding and can't hear the opposing Jewish value that the other camp is upholding. So your camp is upholding uh, the Jewish value of, of attachment to the land, is upholding the, the value of, uh, of remaining faithful to the land. The, the other camp is upholding the value of, uh, of recognizing the right of every people to have the sovereignty that we want for ourselves. Uh, I would put it another way, uh, and, I'll, and I'll end with this, which is that um, in a sense, there are uh, two biblical injunctions uh, that, each, that each of these camps are upholding. And, um, and, and really your, your camp, I would say, is upholding the, uh, the, the love of the land, need to settle the land. The other camp is upholding the injunction to remember that we were strangers in the land of Egypt. These, and the tragedy of the Jewish debate today is that we, are, we have two deep, deeply valid Jewish positions that are in opposition. Okay, one more question and then we'll wrap up. <laughs> 
Oh, you're all very tired, so we'll wrap up as it is. I wanted to, I wanted to leave each of you with the opportunity to, to, to say a final thought. F sorry? Yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah, I, uh, don't worry, we'll get there. You mean I have to address it? Yes, you have to address it. <laughs> and I, I wanted you... But I have something to wrap up with. I wanted you, you can wrap up as well. I wanted you <laughs> to first tell me something, tell us something you think as a people we're getting right morally. We're addressing appropriately. We're seeing the issues in a way we should be seeing it. We're talking about it in the way that we are. And perhaps an issue where we have where you're a bit disappointed and something you would like to see us address better and see better. And Suzanne, I'm, I'm dictating one of your answers on the topic to address the question about women and that. But Gil, can we start with you? Talk about women. <laughs> <laughs> one of the issues that we're getting right is survival. Self-preservation. This, this extraordinary experiment in just simply living and being um, is something that right now we totally take for granted. And the power of taking it for granted comes from the tremendous successes we've enjoyed and endured since 1948. But all of us live and, 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 and swim in the sea of Jewish history, which goes back thousands of years which is filled with pogroms and filled with statelessness, and also filled in the diaspora with moments of greatness. I don't like the lachrymose view, the tear-stained view of Jewish history. I don't look at life in the diaspora as only traumatic. But every single day, it goes back to my opening, every single day we're, we're getting the, the simple survival part right. Parts that we still have to work on? I think within Jewish values and within the democratic values is a tension between the collective and the individual. And I'm going to leave you the, the women's issue. I, I didn't have a chance to speak on the Haredi issue. Um, I have to say that for me as an individualist, and I think that Jewish values, I mean, you go back to the Bible, it's about individual and not just collective. And democratic values about individual, not just collective. And I don't want to look at Haredim simply as Haredim. I want to look at them as individual citizens of the state of Israel. And when I read in the newspaper that we're told that if there's a, a decision on the part of the democratic government of the state of Israel that Every 18-year-old, every 18-year-old Jew, I'll even say, is responsible for serving the army, and then that's going to lead to massive violence. I get furious. As a Jew, I also remember that there's this biblical tradition. You want to talk about biblical tradition and that beautiful, bold man, David Ben-Gurion, who, when he talked about in the Declaration of Independence, the land of Israel being the, 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 the story of the Bible. And we have Bar Kokhba, and we have Giron, uh, and, and, we have, and we have Yehoshua, these are people who chose to fight, not because they wanted to, but because they had to. And so I think on the whole Haredi issue, we're getting it very, very wrong. And I hope that the Talal will push us, the, the post Talal will push us to a whole new space. Suzanne. Yeah, I'm going to start with that issue because, it, because it's uh, less a closing issue. Uh, as the token woman, I'm going to speak about the token question. <laughs> no, I want to relate it to the Haredi issue because I want. I, I think what we get, what we're beginning to get better and right, is beginning to see the complexity of things, and be able to live with complexity rather than one right or wrong answer. And I think that the that the women's issue should be actually linked to the Haredi issue in a very important way, and it's this. To go back to Tal's question, isn't the Jewish state the one place, right, where respect for her, what the Haredim have in fact sought to achieve and what they accomplished over time, is it the right, is it the one place to do that? I would translate that, in fact, uh, into burden sharing, but burden sharing that it went along with an enormous amount of accommodation so that the population was not thrust into a situation in which it had to overly and unduly compromise all of its principles in order to share the burden. Like increased national service, like Haredi units, accommodation, that seems to me exactly what the Jewish state should be doing. Now, saying that, here's the complexity. And the complexity 
is very much that it will require sacrifices in the nature of the army. And the sacrifices in the nature of the army will, to a large extent, fall on the place of women, just as the place of women is already somewhat at risk because of increased uh, religious observance by soldiers in the army. If we're talking about principle, right, the army stands for a certain kind of egalitarianism. And at the same time, absorbing the Haredi population, if it's going to be done in any way that includes a certain sensitivity, will be directly in conflict with that. Now, this is the real world. The real world is a world in which moral principles clash, not in which there's a moral principle on one side and something else on the other. The real world, and I think this is exactly what Yossi was getting at before, right, is in which there are competing values. And I think that actually we're getting better. Here's where I think we're getting better. We're getting better at seeing that questions of competing values are not necessarily questions of a clear right, a clear wrong, and demonization. Yossi, and feel free to speak to the women's issue as well. I'll leave that as a token issue then to, uh, to Suzanne. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, I think that uh, what we're getting right is the deep seriousness and engagement of the discourse itself. The fact that there are so many Jews around the world who are not just concerned about these issues, but are intelligently speaking about them or arguing about these issues. And the whole world is listening in to our arguments. We've, 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 we're making the world in some sense a little bit crazy with all of our arguments. But it's, it's quite an extraordinary moment in Jewish history because we our issues, our internal issues, are being amplified. And I, I, I don't know really how to compare this to other times in Jewish history, but my sense is that the sheer volume of Jewish discourse and the seriousness with which we're taking the issues of the Jewish future is uh, perhaps close to unprecedented. And uh, so in that sense, the discourse itself the very fact of the existence of the discourse, the depth and the, and the breadth of the discourse, is, is extraordinary. And, and every so often, I think it's worth stepping back and just appreciating that fact. Uh, now, in terms of the nature of the discourse, uh, what I said earlier I would just like to, to, to emphasize, which is the deep disappointment that I often feel when I hear the, the, the quality, or I would call it almost a, a one-dimensional aspect of our discourse. So much of what we say is so predictable. You can start with one line, and you, it's like there are certain op-ed writers. You, you know, you get the byline, you see the headline. You don't have to read the piece. And so much of Jewish discourse uh, follows that, that sterile, sterile model, because we, we, we are adept at speaking, and the discourse is really extraordinary, we're not as good at listening. At listening to what our opponent says. And look, in Israel, we're, we're coming out of a very bruising, four decades old debate between left and right, in which the left argued that we can't continue the occupation, and the right argued that uh, we can't make peace with the terrorists. Today, most Israelis would say yes. That's right, the left was right about the occupation, and the right was right about the peace. It took us four decades to reach that point because the left and the right didn't listen to each other. Reality forced us, a majority of Israelis, to acknowledge that each side in that debate had a crucial insight. And I think that that's true for many of our other debates, our cultural debates, and uh, my hope is that we can begin to develop a multi-dimensional Jewish personality that's capable of integrating, that's holding into ourselves competing Jewish voices. I'd, I'd like to end with a brief thought that touches a little bit on the woman's issue and other issues as well. Uh, one of the things that concerns me about, about our situation is that I feel like we have a sovereign state, but we don't yet have a sovereign state of mind. <laughs> 
in that we haven't yet switched to the mode of what it is to run a government, to run a society with different sectors. Now go back to the point of Israel being able to be as Jewish as a democracy allows, in the sense that even if there are sectors who have the conviction that women have a certain role, a state cannot allow that. A state has to have a public space where equality reigns. And there, is a, there are limits, there are spaces outside that basketball that are not valid when you're running a state. There's room for respect and accommodation, but there are also lines where being part of a sovereign state means making that adjustment. The other part of the sovereign idea for me is the, something that at the Engaging Israel uh, in team we're trying very hard, I think, to push against. And that is the idea that, you know, you hear it very often, unless we withdraw from the territories, it's national suicide. If we withdraw from the territories, it's national suicide. Everything's suicide. Everything's Yossi, and here I'll push back a little bit. I, in my assessments, we use the word existential threat almost every three seconds. It's not healthy for us. It's not healthy for a people to have that kind of discussion where if you think, because if you are in that mindset where unless you do what I think, it's going to be suicide, why do I have to listen? Why do I have to have that conversation? And I think particularly because we're at the Hartman Institute and you've spent a couple of days looking at the rabbinic conversation. There's one thing about the rabbinic conversation, particularly in the Talmud, that I think is worth leaving you with tonight. What's amazing about the Gemara to me is that it's not a record, it's not a record of what the halacha is. It's not a kind of just a register of what we need to do. It is a record of the nature of having a Jewish conversation. It is a model of a Jewish conversation. And what strikes you again and again throughout the Talmud is that in the Jewish conversation, the view that loses out the view that the halacha does not go according to is respected, is preserved, is perpetuated through history. We study it. We hold it. It's amazing that that was done outside of a sovereign state of mind, but I think we could benefit a great deal as a people from embracing that kind of discourse. At the end of the day, we can't just argue, and Jews are good at arguing, we have to make decisions. But we should be capable of making decisions in a way that embraces, respects the, the, the opinion of those that lost out at any given time. I want you to join me in thanking Gil, Suzanne and Yossi and thank you very much for tonight.